Hey everyone, before we get started, just quick update, there is now going to be a part 3 as well. When I was originally making part 2, I just wanted to make a one big episode, and the original cut of it was actually over 40 minutes long, and while well, trying to render that would probably have killed my computer, so yeah, it's just getting uh, split into two different episodes now. Um, hey, Peter Jackson did it with The Hobbit, so I'm going to do it as well. I was born 17 years ago. For the past six months, I've been in my basement playing Skyrim. But for all those hours, I've never understood what the hell has been going on. I scoured the internet, searching for wikis, to find even the most obscure events in the Elder Scrolls. Behold, sunlight now enters my room. These are the early hours of the morning, and my few moments of free time. Fueled by obscene amounts of caffeine, I search for the events of the Elder Scrolls lore. Tiber Septum brought peace to Tamriel in Second Era 896 by conquering all of the known world. Thus began the Third Era. Hey, I'm the Loopy Alchemist, and welcome to Tiber Septum Part 2. This is an episode that I've been kicking around in my head for a long time, but I've been putting it off partly just because it's one of the more complicated parts in the lore. And also, just because it's a heck of a lot of information, seriously, the research for this was about seven times the size of a standard Elder Scrolls lore episode. So, one thing I need to make clear right off the bat is that though we do have quite a bit of information on this story, there are still pretty big gaps in it. So, I'm going to be filling that with speculation both from various lore sites and my own. However, I'll hopefully be able to make that clear when I'm doing so. Also, while we do know the events, we don't really know the specific order they take place in. I'm going to be following the chain of events that's given on the Imperial Library, since, I don't know, their version of it just makes the most sense. But Again, this is still something that is debated. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. So, the Tiber Wars is a series of conflicts throughout the second half of the last century of the Second Era. So, during this is when the Third Empire of Tamriel gets forged together. The end result is the end of the Interregnum, which is the period in between the fall of the Riemann Empire. It's also during the Interregnum when the Elder Scrolls Online takes place, by the way, and the rise of the Third Empire, which is how it ends. And Tamriel is fully unified for the first time in its history. Before we get too far, I should probably begin by giving just a brief description of the political state of Tamriel prior to the outbreak of the Tiber Wars. So we'll begin with Cyrodiil, which was a collection of small warring kingdoms who the pocket guide to the Empire described as a petty lot of grasping tyrants. Now, you'll remember, of course, that we just finished up last episode with Tiber Septum fully conquering all of these guys and reunifying Cyrodiil. Moving up north to Skyrim, it's basically 
Well, it's at least pretty close to how it is in the fourth era. So, same holds, again, presumably all technically owing allegiance to a high king, but it doesn't appear that they were really all that unified. So, now moving over to High Rock, it's a bunch of assorted kingdoms, duchies, and baronies, and is described by the Pocket God of the Empire, first edition, as being divided into multiple antagonistic factions. Now we'll head over to Hammerfell, which is, at the outset, under the rule of High King Thassad II, but after his death, it's in a civil war between two different Redguard factions. In Blackmarsh, we don't really know, but it's assumed that there's little to no central authority, and all the real power is in the hands of various different tribes that aren't really too unified. Elsewhere is dominated by a government which changes based on the phases of Master and Secunda, Tamriel's Two Moons. This government was, according to the Pocket Guide of the Empire First Edition, overseen by the thinly veiled dictatorship of the Main himself. And the Main, by the way, is kind of like a type of Khajiit elder, always weighs in on elements of war and politics. Going over to Morrowind, it's under the central authority of the tribunal, but at this point the tribunal's authority is very weak. And this combined with a bickering ground council of the Great Houses prevents really any centralized government. And also, since um, Dagoth Ur and his kin have reawakened, it's really undermined basically everyone in the province. Everyone's at each other's throats, it's not unified, and this is going to prove not so great for them down the road. And finally, we'll end with the first Eldmary Dominion. So this, I believe, is still the one left over from the Elder Scrolls Online, but I'm not entirely sure of that. But given that we don't really see any other Eldmary Dominions, I think, pop up, it's just what I'm going to assume, but with a lot of things in this episode, I could be wrong. So it's the provinces, the Somerset Isles, and Valenwood. It's described by the Pocket Guide to the Empire, 3rd edition, as controlled by the Thalmor, a congress of Bosmeri chieftains and Altmeri diplomats. And of course, Thalmor in this context doesn't mean the crazy you worship Talos and I kill you, it's just kind of an elven term. Skyrim was the first province added to the Empire. It was most likely assimilated without so much as raising a sword. So, not so much campaign as it is a massive recruitment drive. We have two um, phrases of evidence for this, both found in the Pocket Guide to the Empire, both the first and the third edition. He mainly wanted to, quote, recruit the warlike Nords to their side before they came a force of opposition. So it's kind of that passage that leads us to think that he went up to Skyrim first. And doubling down on the whole recruiting part, so, quote, I found many of these mountain villages almost empty of young men, who have been seduced into joining Septim's army by the promises of wealth and glory. So with this now massive Nord army in tow, he most likely marches on High Rock next. With his military genius and the Nord troops, this conquest was a complete walk in the park. Again, High Rock was a multitude of fractious kingdoms that were easily conquered. Well, we don't really know the exact, um, don't really know. We actually have next to no details at all on this actual campaign. It's most likely that he just kind of marched around and picked these guys off one by one. Again, it stated that they're politically fractious, so they were probably too busy squabbling to really band together to offer that much resistance. 
The only major battle that we know of is the Battle of Bourget, where Emil Richten, one of Tiber's head commanders, and the Imperial Squadron, that is like Naval Squadron, crushed Wayrest's naval power in a surprise dawn attack. So this does let us know that there were actually naval forces used in this as well. Probably raiding and cutting off supplies to cities, but beyond kind of that bare speculation, we don't have too many other details. Right now we've got Cyrodiil, Skyrim, and High Rock as part of the Empire, and it's growing nicely. However, things aren't all so perfect back at home. I'm talking, of course, of the Moth Rebellion in Second Era 857. Now, this is just my own speculation right here. We don't really know when exactly this takes place, but... Well, yes, we have the date, but... In terms of what exactly is going on as the other conquests are going on, I'm thinking it most likely takes place right here, just based on exactly when Tiber would have reinforcements handy to send in, and a few details we have on what the Third Legion is doing. So, with that being said, let's go on to just what the heck this thing actually is. So, sources aren't clear at all, but they appear to be a radical contingent of the Cult of the Ancestor Moth, which is actually the cult the Moth Priests are a part of. It was principally fought by the Third Legion, which was mostly made out of newly recruited Clovian peasant boys, so it's that fact that kind of leads me to believe this took place during the conquest of High Rock, because all of the hardened professional Nord troops were clearly tied down doing something at the moment. So they were dispatched to Anvil to quell it, but they were besieged in the Hesioid barracks by the cultists but they do manage to hold out and fight pretty well. This earns them the nickname The Faithful, and luckily for them, reinforcements most likely arrived from High Rock, and the rebellion was quelled with ease with the more experienced troops. They triumphantly re-enter the Imperial City with Tiber, and the rebellion is successfully quelled. Again, we don't know exactly how many Cyrodelic cities were involved in this, but the Imperial City itself was clearly taken. Before we get into the conquest of Hammerfell, we should probably go over the two different factions that are going to feature prominently in our narrative. So first off is the Crowns. They're the faction of King Thassad II. They're descended from the High King and the Na Totambu who ruled Yokuda. They hold Yokudan tradition in very high reference, and hold a great dislike for foreigners. Their influence has been waning since the last High King perished in Second Era 862, so think the more traditional party of Red Guards. The other one we have are the Forebears. They're descended from the Regatta. Interesting fun fact, that's actually where we get the name Red Guard from. So, from the Regatta warrior class that actually conquered the province when they first arrived after the destruction of Yokuda. Unlike the Crowns, they were exposed to many Nedic, so pronounced Nedic, but I think it's pretty clear by now I butcher every single pronuncia pronunciation I come across, and later Breton and Imperial traditions and ideas. They're far more modern and cosmopolitan than their Crown counterparts, and they're more welcoming to the Empire and its way of life. They've adopted and modified Breton and Imperial styles for their dress, architecture, and names. Many have even reorganized the traditional Yokudan spirits and pantheon to fit the Imperial pantheon of the Divines. They're generally more predominant in the coastal cities and other major trade centers, while most crowns live in the far more remote regions, such as the deserts and other inhospitable areas. The crowns have dominated Hammerfell for most of its history, but the forebears did briefly in the Second Era as a republic. Interesting fun fact, if you actually 
look up different Red Guard factions, there's a third one called the Votunix, who are a mix of Crown and Forebear traditions. However, they don't appear until after the Warp in the West, which is well after the time period we're talking about. As we're coming up to the Tiber Wars, it's under the aging king Fasad II, who, you recall, is of the Crown faction. Under a good central authority, Hammerfell initially resisted Tiber's advance really effectively, but after he died, a civil war broke out between Prince Ator, his son, hence the leader of the Crown faction, and the Forebears. After numerous defeats at the hands of Prince Ator, the Forebears signed a pact with the Empire, granting them concessions in exchange for help in the civil wars. This was very bad news for the Crowns, not just because the fact that the best general in all of Tamriel, and probably some of the best troops as well, are now fighting against them, but also because their influence had been steadily waning since the last king perished, in Second Era 862. Also, the Crown forces started butchering Forebear citizenry. So the Imperial forces and the Forebears steadily push back the Crowns, although it is by no means an easy fight. They're eventually pushed back and cornered at Stros Mackay, a small island off the coast of Hammerfell in Second Era 864. After gathering their forces, the Imperials launch an assault on the island. This leads to the Battle of Stros Mackay, also known as the Battle of Hunting Bay. This was won by the Imperials thanks to the shrewd tactics of Admiral Richten and the Empire's secret weapon, a vassal dragon named Nathalargus, even with a dragon on their hands. The Crowns are putting up a really good fight, however, Prince Ator is killed and the tide turns. With Stros Mackay conquered, the Empire swiftly takes over the rest of Hammerfell, imposing provincial governors to rule various parts of it. However, this was not the end of the pacification of Hammerfell. After three months of brutal occupation, both Redguard factions, so the Crowns and the Forebears, end up revolting against their new Imperial rulers. This leads to what is known as the Rebellion of Stros Mackay, the second rebellion we've had to deal with, and it takes place as well in Second Era 864. While the Empire is placing their various provincial governors across Hammerfell, a disappointed Baron Voleg disappears. He is a prominent member of the Forebear faction. Both the Crowns and the Forebears set aside their differences to create the Restless League, a resistance group that immediately begins to harass Imperial occupiers, with a various mix of unconventional tactics. An uprising by the Restless League in Stros Mackay ends up killing Provincial Governor Richten, who, as you recall, won the Battle of Stros Mackay, and a rebellion in Sentinel breaks out too under Baron Volag. Also, the dragon, Nephil of Argus, is killed by Cyrus, who is a prominent member of the Restless League. This forced the Empire to come back to Hammerfell, and hopefully try to settle the situation. This ended up being resulted in the first Treaty of Stros Mackay, the second one being between the Red Guards and the second Eldmary Dominion much later on. So this ended up creating a special relationship in between Hammerfell and the Empire. It is probably best described by Bianchi, the Red Guard wife of the Emperor Sephora Septum, in Wayne Jarth's historical fiction, The Wolf Queen. Quote, We Redguards have a unique relationship with the Empire and Hammerfell. Since the Treaty of Stros Mackay, it's been understood that we are part of the Empire, but not subject. I think this is best summed up by the line, In the end, it was not the might of the Imperial Legions that pacified Hammerfell, but the words and promises of Tiber himself.